So uh, uh, my colleagues from uh, Switzerland, they're very smart people. Uh, I respect them tremendously. And in essence, uh, they're basically saying the same thing that I've been saying, except that they took it one uh, further step uh, at the individual level. And, um, and, and, and this generated a whole lot of controversy uh, because the, the requirements, the, the conditions under which you can be certain there will be no transmission are very complicated. Um, and, and, and so, you know, when you say there is no transmission, all it takes is a couple of studies to show you wrong. Right. Uh, so I rather stick to the uh, notion that uh, uh, you reduce transmission to a great extent and we're all comfortable with that. In the privacy of my uh, office, I will counsel a woman or, or a man, it doesn't matter, whoever, uh, but I just think for the specific purpose, if a woman tells me we're trying to become pregnant and she's positive or negative, it doesn't matter, in the specific setting, uh, we can say, well, we're going to do it once or twice or three times. But as I said before, um, if it, this is going to become uh, the norm, uh, there are a variety of reasons why uh, a person's viral load may become out of control, the seminal con content of uh, HIV could become out of control, and unbeknownst to the individual, you will transmit. Um, now, I'm sorry to take so long, but I, I had to uh, expand on this. Um, you have to realize that if you accept to engage in a long-standing relationship with an HIV-infected person, uh, you basically have indicated that you are uh, prepared to live with a degree of uncertainty around your sexual activity. Let's be perfectly clear. Condoms are not 100% protective. So where the Swiss are coming from is from the perspective that antiretroviral therapy is at least as effective as condoms in decreasing transmission. So if you ask me a different question, which is, Dr. Montaner, is it appropriate to recommend the use of condoms instead of discordant couples? We wouldn't have this discussion. I would say yes. Uh, but because antiretroviral therapy has other connotations and resistance and the like, uh, we're very negative about it, when in fact there is published work that suggests that the reduction with condoms used appropriately or with uh, antiretroviral therapy is basically to the same extent. If you use both, you get better protection, and that's what we're saying. But if you are comfortable with condoms, uh, well, maybe you're not that uncomfortable uh, in the setting that the Swiss have described. Um, as public health people, we're not prepared to make that recommendation. On an individual levels, I think I'm pretty comfortable. Thank you. The next question is to speak to the issue of transmission of different strains of HIV in a couple who are both HIV positive. How likely is it to transmit HIV to your partner, HIV-1 versus HIV-2? Well, um, the transmission of, uh, uh, let me put it this way. HIV infection does not prevent you from becoming HIV infected all over again, uh, which is very worrisome because it suggests that we're going to have a vaccine for HIV mañana, if you know what I mean, uh, because it, that, that, that's very problematic. Uh, uh, so that's number one. Number two is that uh, instances of HIV transmission uh, in people who are HIV infected have been documented, very well documented. How often does it occur? We don't know because those studies have not been done in large numbers of people. But we know it because uh, with genetic um, uh, testing, you can actually fingerprint your HIV. So I can take your HIV today and say it looks like this, take your partner's HIV and say it looks like that. That's like a, like a fingerprint for your virus, is genetically speaking. And then uh, a little while later, you come back and you have your partner's HIV as as, as well as yours. Now, that may not be a problem if we were both had the same sort of garden variety, we call it wild type mm -hmm. HIV. But if my partner, say, uh, has an HIV uh, that is multiple drug resistant, it's a very nasty virus, then I'm subjecting myself to it. So I often tell my patients, look, this is very simple. Um, HIV infection doesn't preclude acquiring other HIV. So if you don't practice safer sex, you can give your HIV to others, which is not a good idea. You can acquire other uh, nasty stuff over there. But if you go into a party, just let's be clear, simple, and, and you mingle with half a dozen people that are HIV, 
I guarantee you that when you leave that party, uh, I don't care what they got, but you will have received the worst of each one of them. And that's a pretty nasty deal. So I honestly believe that when people say, well, I'm HIV already, so what the hell? It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to use condoms. They're making a huge mistake. Not just uh, because they can get other stuff, which is important. Uh, hepatitis C or uh, CMV or who knows what. But they can also get more and worse HIV. And that's not a good idea. Next question. If someone is undetectable fire load for 10 years, can the person stop heart therapy? Oh, yeah. You can stop heart therapy any day of the week. But that's a bad idea. <laughs> you know, we did those experiments back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the first um, time that we came out with antiretroviral therapy in 1996, um, a, a, a very important piece of work was done and presented at the same conference by David Ho. Some of you may remember because that year he was – it, was, it should have been me, but that's okay. Uh, he was named the Man of the Year by Time Magazine. Uh, actually, the Argentinian press named me the Man of the Year, and they called me Dr. Esperanza, which means Dr. Hope. He was Dr. Hope, and it was a joke. But anyways, um, so uh, 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 he did very elegant work uh, where he uh, estimated the amount of time that it would take once you suppress the replication of the virus for the virus to die off and then, oop, it's gone, and you're cured. And he said uh, it will take uh, between 18 months to 24 months. And, and, you know, there were different estimates, whatever. But, but we had a very sad story. A patient of ours who had been enrolled in the original study that led us to describe the triple drug therapy cocktail um, ran into problems, and three years after being undetectable for three years, uh, showed up in the emergency room after an overdose, and he was brain dead. Couldn't do anything about it. The treatment had been stopped. I get called several days after, and I said, wait a moment. Don't do anything. Uh, we need to talk to the family. So I went to the family, and I said, look, uh, this is terrible, but uh, uh, this person holds a very important piece of information for us. We need a blood sample. They said, of course, no problem. We need a blood sample. Within a week, his virus was in the millions. So we, at that time, knew that David Ho um, got a lot of hope, but he got it all wrong. Uh, that was not the right estimate. Since then, uh, this has been reproduced in other settings, and it has been confirmed. You stop treatment, the virus comes back with a vengeance, usually uh, uh, by seven days, typically uh, reaches a peak at uh, one month. Uh, and in doing so, you activate your immune uh, responses against the virus, which actually make people sick. Uh, whether you can feel it or not, uh, there is an ongoing inflammatory process that hurts people, actually, it can kill people. And so as a result of that, since 2004, we have recommended when people start treatment, stay on treatment. And it's not that it's bad news that you have to stay on treatment. You have to stay in treatment because that's good for you. It's good for you. It keeps you alive, keeps your immunity better, keeps no virus uh, floating around, and, and keeps your inflammatory responses to the virus cool so you don't get hurt by it. Current estimates, and you're going to laugh at this, current estimates of the time that is required uh, for the viral reservoirs. Now, this is different. This is the amount of virus that you have integrated in the genome of your cells. So I said before, you stop viral replication, you shut down the virus, the virus goes to sleep, it's in remission. But that virus is integrated in the nucleus of your cell, so the moment you withdraw therapy, that virus activates itself and makes more virus. So if you now suppress that virus, keep it there, the virus will be clear from your body at the same rate that the cells that are infected with the virus die off. But the bad news is that the cells that are infected with the virus, some of them are expected not to die off for 70 years. So the current estimate is that it will take somewhere between 60 and 80 years of continued, perfect, fully suppressive therapy before you can hope to stop treatment and the virus not come back. I will not be here to see that. We need a better treatment, and we need a cure. What's the difference in prognosis if we start heart earlier or later, like in the latent phase or after symptomatic AIDS, in terms of prognosis? Um, well, that's a tricky question. <clears throat> um, ideally, we want people to start early because they can tolerate the treatment better, 
they get better immune responses. Uh, they, they basically they have a whole lot of host of uh, things that have not happened to them yet. So it's very easy to deal with them. Uh, and, and basically you are completely normal. You start a treatment and you just carry on. Hopefully, um, if you wait too late, uh, say until your immune system, as I said earlier, is below 50. And remember the number is 400 to 1400. So below 50, that's way too late. People actually die on their way to 50. Uh, so it's not about what's your prognosis if you start when you're 50. Now, you may not be there to start to begin with. And among those that start at 50 or below, uh, there are some that we can never bring them back on, on time. So they get sick, deathly sick, before they can get better. So I often have to tell them, look, this is going to be rough. You may get sick before you get better. You may get very, very sick. You may have to get sick before you get better. Stay with the program because we will we'll, most of the time we'll bail you out. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we can. Uh, so waiting too late is very dangerous. Now you might say, well, 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 I didn't mean that late. I meant, uh, say, 200 CD4s. 200 CD4s, 300, that's a uh, middle of the road. You know, people are not quite sick yet. They may have a little symptom here or there. Say, you know, can I wait a bit more? Well, the truth is that we now realize that HIV is not just about immune deficiency. So we used to recommend that you wait until 250 uh, because that's before the immune system is so low that you start getting sick with opportunistic infections. But the reality is that, uh, yes, we can protect those people against immune uh, 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 related infections or um, uh, opportunistic infections. But, but their ability to mount an immune response is compromised, number one. Number two, more important than that, is that they already lived often uh, years, a decade sometimes, with HIV. And we didn't appreciate that before. But the treatment interruption studies have taught us that when you have virus multiplying in your blood, that virus is activating an immune response. The immune system is actually very ill-prepared to control the ability of the virus to replicate. That doesn't mean that it's not going to try. So continuously, when you have virus in your system, your immunity is fighting, 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 fighting. And when that happens, when that happens, um, the immunity generates uh, complexes of immune material, junk, and that junk gets deposited throughout your uh, vascular system. It gets deposited in your brain, in your heart, everywhere, your kidneys. And so we now have been able to demonstrate that people who have a, an elevated viral load, they also have markers of inflammation uh, circulating in the blood at all times. And so what happens if there is a wear and tear of the inner part of your vessels uh, that then promotes atherosclerosis? Uh, and, and damage. And so kidney dysfunction, rena, um, uh, liver dysfunction, uh, pul pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, cardiovascular problems, heart attacks, strokes, uh, all of this is greatly accelerated in the absence uh, of us suppressing the virus. So today, uh, our approach to treating HIV has actually reversed completely. And what I usually tell my uh, fellows or uh, students is you, we used to say, how late can I start treatment? We now say, give me a reason why I shouldn't start this person today. Today meaning the day that you are first found to be HIV positive. Now, if you have no inflammatory markers, extremely low viral load, a normal CD4 count, and a perfect health, eh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll watch it. Uh, those individuals are way less than 1% uh, of the people that we see in my practice. I am not comfortable recommending no treatment in anybody but that 1%. Okay. So, Julio, we have um, about eight more questions. I'll be sure. Okay. <laughs> I've done this before, you see. It's body language. So someone wants to thank you for this wonderful talk and that you mentioned health systems uh, failing individuals. And could you talk about more measures uh, that we need for the capacity of the health system to provide better care with people living with HIV AIDS, particularly in low-income countries, and how antiretroviral therapy could be scaled up better in these resource-poor settings? And you want me to be sure? <laughs> 
The uh, take home points. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, to make a long story short, uh, this is a subject for a whole discussion, mm -hmm. but uh, the truth is antiretroviral therapy can be done successfully uh, everywhere. Malawi is doing beautifully uh, in terms of distributing antiretroviral therapy. Uh, Dignitas and a number of other NGOs are doing it. Uh, they are using uh, peer uh, uh, treatment uh, systems in the absence of doctors, and it can be done beautifully. So you know what? Barriers, yes, lots. But with a bit of imagination, we can do it everywhere. Uh, we're talking about uh, doing it in, uh, everywhere in Africa, South Africa, uh, uh, and uh, I have no hesitation. So when they tell me that it, you know, it cannot be done in Kamloops or in Prince George or whatever, that's because you haven't tried. Okay. How does heart actually work on eradicating the virus and stopping its uh, replication? So heart doesn't eradicate the virus. It stops the ability of the virus to multiply. And if you think about it, um, uh, as a sort of a, a machinery that is trying to build a new uh, instrument, whatever it is, uh, uh, the, the virus uh, it basically has a genetic code that allows it to make another one of these and another one of these and another one of these. And so what, what the drugs most typically do is they interfere with somewhere in the machinery. Uh, for example, uh, if, if you need a piece that looks like this to go here, so that your final product looks like that. Uh, so what we've done is we, we created one of these, but it has a, a, a funny blockade here at the end. So it's, it, that's called competitive inhibition. So uh, all of these drugs, they are basically like cups like this, and they have some screwed up thing in the bottom so that the next cup that allows this to continue to grow cannot come in. So either they stop the chain that allows the virus to form, or they, what they get into the, 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 the processor that is bringing it up to here, and because it has this thing here, it gets it and it blocks the process. So that, those are the two fundamental mechanisms. So really, we're competing against the, either the, the substrates that need to be placed uh, to continue making virus, or we are interfering with the... Um, uh, uh, little uh, hands that are, are supposed to move the virus forward in the processing chain. It's pretty simple stuff. Um. What is the BC Center for Excellence currently doing to prevent HIV transmission in the BC prisons, and what more can be done? Ooh. God, you These are tough audience. Uh, well, uh, in a nutshell, we're not doing enough. Um, and uh, uh, we, you know... Uh, the problem is that we're overwhelmed. I mean, we have uh, a whole lot of areas where there is uh, need for more action. So the truth is we, we focus our efforts where we see uh, the biggest sort of uh, 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 impact of our activities. We have had a lot of success uh, the interacting with the uh, uh, prison system and educating them of what they should be doing about it. But we have not yet gone into the prisons, although we're training a couple of people on prison-specific issues to make that an additional focus of our research. But so far, uh, we have not really uh, gone into the prisons. Okay. This is a question related most likely to HIV and Hep C co-infection, but I'm not sure if it's also related to just Hep C alone. So. Um, there's a question around any discussion of the center adopting hepatitis C treatment, um, a desire to be taken on for HIV, HCV or hepatitis C virus uh, treatment to be taken on by centralized, centralized proactive and evidence-based authority. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the center has a mandate to treat for HIV and to look after the HIV programs. Hepatitis C is looked after by a separate agency and we have been able to have a cordial relationship with the uh, hepatology community. And, um, and, and, you know, I mean, the, the center could take a whole lot of other things, including, you know, mental health and so on and so forth. But uh, the truth is that there are different agencies that look after different things, and um, we'll just stick to our turf. Is that fair? Um, someone's asking about how our immune systems may have evolved to battle uh, mutations of HIV strains. Is that, is there anything on that front in immunology? 
you know, um, the only thing that I can uh, tell you about it is that uh, um, the, uh, the, the immune system, for the most part, is fairly ineffective at dealing with HIV. And every immune intervention that has been tried to deal with HIV, including massive, huge, long-term clinical trials of immune stimulant uh, materials, have failed, every single one of them, to make any difference. They may be able to make your CD4s look better. They may, they may the CD4 count go up, but they fail to change the prognosis of the disease. So we're pretty convinced that currently, and that's part of the reason why we know for sure that HIV is at because everything else has failed. Uh, and so immune modulators, uh, interleukins and the like, have had no impact on the natural history of HIV, even when they are able to double your CD4 counts. So this is not about building your CD4 counts. I have patients that come to me and they say, my mother found this natural product that makes my CD4 better. And I say, well, it doesn't matter. They say, no, no, but I want to stay with that because my CD4s are better. I say, no, my friend, it's the virus. You need to fix the virus. You need to shut down the virus because it's making you sick. No, but my CD4s are better. It doesn't matter. And so um, Richard Harrigan likes to say, virology 20, that's the number of drugs that we have, immunology zero and we keep on counting. Someone asked the question of what is meant by the downtown community, the downtown east side, and yes, it's the community that is largely being served by Insight, so I can answer that for you. Thank you. The next question, though, is um, sort of a theoretical question. If one copy of the virus is all that exists in a human being, what is the impact on this on one's quality of life? <laughs> Well, you know, you have to realize that that's the way you got infected. Uh, and so uh, it, it's devastating. One copy is what it takes. Uh, if that copy is successful in making another copy and another copy and another copy, and the virus makes uh, uh, hundreds and thousands and millions of copies all the time. So um, don't fool yourself. Uh, if you're under treatment and you have one copy per milliliter of plasma, uh, or one copy left, you're fine, because that copy is being shut down, right? It's under drug, what we call drug pressure. The pressure of the drugs is keeping the virus down, undetected, you can't see it, but you remove that, and it's, it makes it like that. So uh, uh, it's thinking about it quantitatively is dangerous, because you think, oh, I only have one copy, I'm fine. Well, you're not. <laughs> that copy will make another one. And, another, and then after that, you have a million. One to a million. How are your lobbying efforts working with the uh, Harper government regarding support for heart? <laughs> and may I add insight? <laughs> That's your question. <laughs> ah, fabulous. We love each other. We send uh, letters all the time. And, You're corresponding? Uh, He's your yeah, pen pal. absolutely. Uh, I send him long letters, and he sends me one line uh, <laughs> saying, go to hell. <laughs> it's a uh, love-hate relationship. You know, um, uh, now seriously, um, uh, I think we have a serious problem in this country at the moment uh, in that uh, uh, Mr. Harper thinks that he's better than uh, me and all of us, that he knows what's best to fix HIV, drug addiction, mental health, homelessness, and whatever. And if we all do what he tells us, we're going to be fine. And I have a, a piece of news for him. I have four children. They're in their 20s. And I keep on telling them what to do, and they don't follow what I say. And we're not fine. And, uh, and if he pretends that that's going to work with all of us, when it doesn't work at my home, uh, he's deluded himself. Uh, so the truth is uh, we live in a pluralistic society. We need to accommodate a whole lot of things. Uh, what I like is irrelevant. Uh, we have evidence that dictates what it should, is that you, we should be doing at a societal level. I tell my children what I want them to do, and uh, we have a discussion, and then we compromise. Well, he should learn from that. Uh, and we will have a much better uh, country. Uh, for him to continue to pursue uh, ideologically driven uh, 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 public health measures is not going to do anything to fix this problem. The war on drugs has failed uh, here, south of the border, everywhere. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, we need to change the way we're doing things. More money to the cops uh, to chase uh, people that are addicted to drugs is not a good idea. Uh, uh, if we per, were to put more social workers, and uh, nurses, and, and community peers, and agencies to support them, we would have a much better outcome. Uh, ch chasing insight uh, is a bad idea. Uh, to have the, 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 the law courts 
telling him that that's a bad idea is stupid because we already told him so. The court told him so twice, and he's still not listening. So uh, we need to change the way we do business. Uh, we need to meet people where they're at, recognizing that it's going to take time for people to find a way to get to a better level of functioning. And if they don't, they don't. Uh, we need to support them where they're at. You know, you don't take smokers and chop their fingers because they smoke. You don't take obese people and tie them to a, a bed because they're obese. You don't take people who have a heart attack and you say, we're not going to do a bypass because you eat chocolate. <laughs> right? Well, that's the way he treats my patients. And I resent that, and we should all resent that. And we should send a very strong message to him that it's time to move on, grow up, become an adult. Uh, he's having difficulty with that, and we need to explain to him that this is not acceptable. So this is the last.